Good morning. You ready? Okay, we're going to liven things up a little bit. All right, I know we have a big hall here, and I, let me just check in the back. Can you hear us okay? You're good, and you're going to give me a thumbs up or thumbs down if that changes. All right, um, really a privilege uh, to be here today along with uh, Greg and Dean. Um, we, uh, we hope in the next 45 minutes to uh, leave you wanting for uh, more participation and more information regarding a, a very major change in the healthcare industry, of which you are all um, a really important part. Um, I bet I could not find a person in here who wouldn't agree that the healthcare system needs improving. Agree? Okay. Um, it's one of the most critical topics of our time, the most consequential and important and pivotal. And we're going to spend the next 45 minutes on what we believe is a really important component of that. You know, if you look back, um, we have had years of innovation, but have, it has been largely uh, incremental. Important, but incremental. And um, if there ever was a time for game-changing innovation, it is now. There are a number of factors uh, that are coming into play around uh, a number of areas that we'll talk about that we think are converging on an important time, and our leadership in that is very important. Um, innovation is largely trapped today in a system that is not transparent, that doesn't connect providers, employers, and the ultimate consumer. And we're going to, ex we're going to explore that today. If you look at the, um, the last, call it decade, um, there's a real shift in the system from what was a, what we would call a provider era to a health plan era, moving toward an era of the individual and the consumer and the consumer's responsibility and the consumer's voice. Employers are changing their role. They have gone from providers of the health plans to the financiers. They have an inherent interest in not only the cost, but the health and well-being of their employees and the productivity and the business impact that comes with that. They have, they have been active participants in driving change for economic reasons, for more holistic reasons around the well-being of not only their employees, but their employees' families and our productivity um, across the U.S. Let me highlight just five critical dynamics um, before we dive into uh, some specifics around, uh, around how this works. How we pay for care is being transformed from volume to outcomes. And you can correlate that to any other industry that has gone through that kind of a shift from activity to paying for value. And that change is, is alive and well and moving uh, quickly. The emergence of new markets like narrow and tiered networks and focus on individual customer acquisition versus through blocks that might be associated with a particular employer agreement with a health plan. You know, think about millions of people moving from being a subject of an employer agreement to an individual to an individual choice. With that comes in the shift around individual accountability. When I have to choose my plan, I have transparency about the composition of those health plans, how they relate to my health needs, and the cost associated with that, I become more accountable for my health and my consumption of health care. So a greater level of accountability. New taxes and regulation. I know this group spends a lot of time on that. The regulatory environment is highly dynamic. We know it's highly political, but it is also rooted in a set of economics that we know need to change. Um, it's forcing employers, employees, providers, and health plans to rethink their business models and how they deliver benefits to employees or serve those employees under a benefit agreement. And then there's new technology. It's forcing competition among new entrants and a focus on mobile and consumer tools. So all of these trends converging on value, the consumer, transparency, and accountability. So with that as a backdrop, let me, uh, let me start with Dean. Um, and I, I, uh, I didn't have the opportunity to introduce Dean, but want to say um, Dean Carter is one of the most innovative HR leaders in the country and is driving an exceptional level of change across the industry, and uh, we're really uh, privileged to have him with us today. So Dean, when you think about your role, not only in leading at Sears, but more broadly, when you think about the employer community, what do you think some of the uh, major implications are for the various stakeholders around uh, consumerism in that trend? I think you hit on it just a moment ago in terms of the individual. So in the past, if the company's the one that uh, selected my health care, so they're the one who selected basically the type of plans I had to choose from or plan I had to choose from, or the carrier, um, that was something the company did. Now, 
under the exchange, the individual has the responsibility and accountability to pick their own, and they, they own their choices. So this is a really, it's a very, very different shift, and I talked a little bit in terms of how employees view that shift and how their behavior changes. Um, the second shift is uh, the employer. You know, we, uh, we're very concerned about the livelihood of our associates. We want to make sure they have homes and they live in homes so we don't buy their, health, their home insurance. We want to make sure they, are, they have the, the ability to get to work and uh, have reliable transportation, but we don't pay for their auto insurance. Um, and we're considered about the, the wellness of our associates. Um, so in this situation, we give them a lot more choice and how they can make choices for healthcare. So we are providing medical insurance in this, in this situation, still the same kind of plan, but um, the way we think about wellness needs to change because the associates um, are picking up potentially some of the risk in this situation. So the, uh, the employer in terms of wellness changes. The, um, the carrier, this has been a, for the carrier, I think, uh, as a stakeholder, the issue of value becomes important. Because now, the person they needed to sell in the room was me. So in, a, in an RFP, you'd have all the carriers, or the, you, they would have a conversation to be me and the salesperson, and then I would pick for the entire employee population. So they were selling value to me. Under an exchange, the value proposition is actually between the carrier and the associate. And I'll talk about some of the implications of that. And then finally, um, what I'm finding is once our associates get used to making the decision around what carrier and what value in a carrier is, and they begin to own their own cost or even assuming some of the risk, then the next question goes to the provider. And so I know three years into the exchange, um, Christy, our, our, our associates are looking for more transparency at the provider level. They're not okay with going to the grocery <coughs> store and saying all milk is a $20 copay. Um, they are, they're interested in kind of what is the price of healthcare and what are my choices. And so I think um, providers as a stakeholder need to understand uh, that transparency is coming and how are you going to manage that because as more and more companies go in the exchange, there's an interest in, uh, in a lot more transparency and pricing at the provider level. Very good. I was, uh, I was struck. Dean called me last year during their uh, benefits fair and he, he actually sent me a picture and said, Christy, you should, you should be out here in Hawthorne Woods because there's something happening in our cafeteria. Like, what are we serving, you know, new fish? I didn't know. So he said, no, 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 it's our benefits fair. And, and, the, and the health plans come every year, and they, they set up booths, not unlike what we have here. And um, there's a lot of circulation and a lot of um, uh, kind of free gifts and things like that, little pencils and what have you. He said, no, there's lines. There's questions. There, the health plans are being interviewed against my needs as a consumer. And you actually sent the picture across with consumers in action which yeah. I thought was, I thought was very interesting and, and very telling of the different choices people make about how they engage with the health plans. In 20 years of, of benefits fairs, and the, the most difficult question usually is, I want the red Snoopy or the blue Snoopy, or I'd like a Frisbee instead of a bottle opener. And uh, now the tough questions really were, because we had some carriers who changed the pricing and said, um, and so she's saying, why'd you change your prices? Like, why are your prices different than the one at the table next door? What's the difference between your value and that value? And it wasn't me asking the questions in a, in a closed room. It was a long line of associates wanting to understand. They just wanted to pick the best health care they, they, and the best overall price. Why did you change your price? Is there something different? Why are you more expensive? Why are you less? And they needed to answer those questions. And I, I don't think they were used to answering those questions. They wanted to say, well, are you sure you don't want a blue Snoopy? Like the, <laughs> it, was a, it was a very different kind of conversation than um, benefits fairs in the past. Very good. OK, Greg. When you think about these trends and you think about new entrants and, the, and the, what the transparency and consumerism drives across the ecosystem, how do you think about that? Well, listen, if you just listen to how Dean just described the situation, I met thousands of associates, I think fundamentally need change in behavior. Absolutely. Doing something they've never done before around the topic of their own wellness and health. I mean, that's unprecedented. If you actually plan that out and lay that out over across the U.S. economy and think about that over the next 10 years, that level of consumerism is is really fundamental. It's tremendous in terms of sort of what the ultimate outcome could be. And what Dean has done is literally set up an ecosystem so that there's literally more transparency, more choice, more options, and in the end, what I think you hear him being most excited about is greater accountability from the associates themselves in terms of how they think about healthcare. That's a pretty powerful set of changes. Against that backdrop, Christy, you know, you know this better than I do. We're seeing lots of dynamics out there. First and foremost, everybody wants to now get into the game. Everybody wants to talk about change. Not a lot of folks want to actually do it. But if you just look at the Fortune 500, I think 24, 25 companies in the last 18 months have come into the healthcare world. Sort of brand new entrants into healthcare, Fortune 500. So the big world's actually out there. 
Um, Dean talked about providers. They're also trying to understand how to sort of engage in this ecosystem a little bit differently. I mean, look at uh, a player like Aetna. Aetna's literally started a subsidiary in which they're literally looking at their investments, uh, one-off, really competing with VC firms in terms of innovation, in terms of what they're doing. Um, and, you know, you sort of think about how that plays out over time, the implications of that over time. It truly fundamental. You're seeing situations um, that, that really show up, you know, very, very, very differently. Um, you know, uh, even look at Anthem. Anthem ac actually is paired up with IBM um, and really thinking about data in a different way in terms of sort of case management and the process around that. So a whole set of fundamental changes that are happening in the world today around the topic of innovation that really are driving a lot of, uh, a lot of differences. And that all comes back to this idea of consumerism uh, and how consumers are changing their behavior in the context of that. And I, that's, uh, that's really, Christy, just beginning. Well, think about, think about a market that is 2.8 trillion. No one knows that number better than this group. When you think about a market of that size that's fundamentally being reshaped around the consumer and the consumer voice, you are going to get new entrants and you're going to get a lot of competition for that, for that consumer. It's alive and well. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the basics of private exchanges. Um, we found in, in these kinds of sessions it's, it's really useful to just step back and talk a little bit about, about how they work. You know, the issues in, in health delivery are not new. We know that. Um, that's been, been worked on for a number of years. The most recent of which were generally centered around plan design, consumer-directed health plans, high deductible plans to begin to shift some of the cost, the accountability, to reduce the volatility for a particular employer. But when you come back to the fundamental principles, those weren't being addressed. Transparency, choice, Greg talked about these, competition and alignment along a full spectrum of solutions. And those spectrums of, spectrum of solutions include traditional self-insured benefits. Um, they've been the mainstay of large companies for decades. Um, and they, and increasingly, um, plan design changes, wellness programs, productivity efforts. But they're insufficient for the reasons Dean, uh, Dean and Greg just described. On one end of that spectrum are private healthcare exchanges. Um, it's essentially a new market where employers contribute to their employees with a subsidy, a contribution, they essentially give them money, and they choose from a variety of plans and providers. To Dean's point and the, the visual of the cafeteria, they make an individual choice around the plan that works for them, and they exercise that right to choose and that accountability that comes with it. Now, there's a lot of, uh, call them flavors in the market associated with private healthcare exchanges. There's fully insured versus self-insured, single versus multi-carrier, the large market employers, the mid-market employers, and the smaller market. Those are all dimensions on a, on, a, on a market change. At Aon, we have put forward the first fully insured multi-carrier exchange because we fundamentally believe this is the only way to create sustainable value in the market. We can move it among the participants in the market or we can drive fundamental value we can improve the healthcare system and improve population health. We believe we need to do both of those and we are essentially retraining years and years of behavior and business models and changing business models to do that. So let's, let's hear from Dean, so how does it work? So from, sure. from your seat and those of your employees, exactly how does this work? So the exchange itself um, sets up a series of five, in this particular situation, five plans. So there are five plan designs, as you guys know, Right now, every company has their own individual plan design. I say like, it's like snowflakes. Every company has their own individual group of plan design. Under the exchange, there are five. Um, then the carriers bid on those five particular plans based on my risk pool. So it's not I'm involved in the rest of the risk pool. It's based on Sears Holdings risk pool. So it's still our plan. Then what happens at the associate levels? And then they bid those plans and they price them according to what they see the risk pool that, that's available. From the associate level, the associate goes in and says, okay, I'm, uh, I'm gonna pick among these plans. First thing I'm gonna decide is it gonna be employee, family, employee plus spouse, kids. The next decision is what plan level. So this is the five plans. So if I'm with Aon, or if I'm with Walgreens, or I'm with Sears, it's the same five plans. So they pick which plan is the right plan for them, and they go all the way from um, a typical HMO type plan with a copay to a high deductible plan. And there's a variety of plans in between. Once I pick the plan or the metallic level for that, then I go into, and let's say I pick the um, bronze level. From the bronze level, it goes over and I see all the carrier's prices for the bronze level. 
And what's embedded in this is we've chosen to give a specific or defined um, contribution or defined subsidy. It doesn't matter which plan level you choose and it doesn't matter which carrier you choose, Sears is paying the same number. So it doesn't, whatever you choose. And then, in a very transparent way, you can see the difference between either the cost in the plan level or the cost between the different carriers. So I can look at carrier A, carrier B, carrier C, carrier D. They all have different prices for the same exact plan. And then I decide what's value. Is this carrier A more valuable than carrier B or carrier C? Do I want to just pick lowest price? Do I want to pick highest price because I they're in my provider network or for whatever reason? And we have some pretty good data on why people choose and that changes over time, but then they pick the carrier that they, they want to go with, and then that's basically how it works. Um, there was, I don't pick the plan, they pick the plan, um, and how be employees behave over time also changes with that. So again, five commoditized plans, carriers bid on this, all the carriers have different prices, the employee goes in, picks their level, and then they pick the carrier that they choose based on value that they see for price. And, and it's very interesting to see, and maybe you have a chance to talk about this, how that changes over time. Yep. It's very interesting. We enroll annually about uh, 9 million people in employer-sponsored plans. The average time spent by a given employee in annual enrollment is between two and three minutes in a self-insured structure. The average time in the private exchange personal accountability model is between 13 and 16 minutes. And it is not because it is more complicated, it's less complicated. They're spending the time understanding either analytically or we have example, we have tools that help you find a person like me, I'm a family of four, I have these needs, I'm this demographic. I'm thinking about it because I'm choosing. And you know, you're getting more, you're getting uh, better matched plans because I'm choosing and I'm getting more accountability in that process. It's an, it's an interesting statistic that um, has held true uh, now for three years in a row. So a little bit about when you kind of step back from how it works to the, to the value proposition. So how is value actually driven in this market? In order for this model to be sustainable, you have to drive value versus move the value and the um, economics around. And that, that's our commitment to do that. As I said, this is the first fully insured multi-carrier exchange. Actually, the only one. Um, and the reason we believe it's sustainable, if you look at any other industry and what's been done along the value chain of that industry to drive value, the principles are the same. Transparency, choice, you have alignment of interests, and you have competition for the consumer. Those are tried and true principles. They apply to any other industry. So when you apply them to the healthcare industry and you look end to end and you create that alignment and you create that competition and choice, the value will emerge. You will see um, empowering employees as consumers and holding them accountable as we've talked about. We'll see greater innovation. When you have to compete for the consumer and you have to drive fundamental value, innovation will occur. It's how capitalism works. You, you all know that it's what you do every day. And as you align stakeholder interests, that innovation gets pointed to where value is created. We lower risk for employers and reduce their volatility. And by the way, that doesn't simply mean transferring the risk. You lower the risk because you're creating that alignment between my needs and a plan choice and the economics. As an employer, I go from accountable for your health care to the financier. I still have an accountability as an employer to provide a competitive benefit. I care about your well-being. I care about productivity. But I'm no longer owning your health care decisions. I'm facilitating it through an open market. Okay? So I've lowered my risk. I've reduced my volatility by spreading that risk and creating accountability and alignment where it, where it hadn't been. And I'm delivering better health care value in the system by trending the cost curve. De we're on year three. The cost curve in a fully insured structure is 150 basis points approximately each year lower than the average health care cost. Innovation is being driven and consumption is being managed. It improves service quality. When you have to compete for the consumer, you're going to compete on quality. You're not just going to compete on price because you won't be able to retain the consumer. You're not sitting behind a three-year contract with an employer. And administration will be simplified. Dean talked about the five plans. We have employers with whom we work in self-insured structures that have upwards of 50 or 60 plans. 
and all kinds of perturbation that goes with that. So think about behind the scenes, all of the complexity that goes into designing and administering those through the healthcare system. We are very confident that the growth in private healthcare exchanges over the next uh, few years will do nothing but accelerate. And there's a couple of key factors that will drive that. Uh, the healthcare challenges are, are unchecked to date. Healthcare reform will create an acceleration. The population is fundamentally not more healthy than they were last year. Um, to the trend in the volatility absolutely has to be addressed. There isn't an employer, we serve 350 of the Fortune 500. There is not an employer who doesn't have this as number one, two, or three on the agenda of the executive team and the board of that company. And then the impending Cadillac tax. When you have a 40% tax on plans over a certain threshold, that is an economic imperative that no employer can back up from or ignore. They have to deal with that, and they have to deal with it in a way that doesn't simply transfer that economic responsibility into their, into their employee base. We poll our, large, uh, our largest employers. 33% believe over the next five years they will adopt a, a private, uh, fully insured model of, some, of uh, some rate of increase over the next three to five years. That has been consistent. That has been highly consistent. If you look at the analyst reports and the rate of increase that any of the analysts suggest, they suggest upwards of 40 million people out of, call it 150 million, who would be eligible, would come into this model within the next five years. Um, in terms of our own active and retiree exchanges, we've seen a 60% uh, over the last year, a 60% increase in clients and a 40% increase in covered employees, moving from a self-insured structure to a fully insured private exchange. Will this be a straight line? Absolutely not. No new market development is, but the trends are gaining momentum, and they're gaining momentum in a sustainable way. So, Greg, as we um, as we thought about this for Aon, our own company, and our own our own colleagues, um, we clearly made an investment in the market for all the reasons we've talked about, and we made the decision to apply this model to Aon. Can you talk a little bit about uh, how? You, so, putting your CEO of Aon hat on. Um, and a, uh, a leader of our company and 65,000 colleagues. How, how do you think about the exchange as it applies to us? Well, I, Dean captured this very, very well as he described it with Sears. The, uh, the, the example holds very, very strongly for Aon. First of all, fundamentally what we're talking about here with alignment and choice and accountability, behavior changes. Uh, and fundamentally what we're talking about is the concept that wellness matters. And it matters sort of at the coal face with your colleagues, with your employees, fundamentally. There's data and facts everywhere. You know, our, our data suggests, and it holds for Aon too, upwards of 90% uh, look into your firms, your companies, and basically make a judgment on how you think about wellness. And it matters to 87% of them. That's a big deal. Uh, when they're in around engagement, 70% plus believe the story and the conversation around wellness matters. We've seen that across the industry. We've seen that at Aon. Dean has seen that at Sears. Fundamentally matters. Productivity. We all know the indirect costs of health can be two to three times the direct costs. That fundamentally is affected, full stop. Um, so a whole series of things happen. Productivity and cost as they come together, $1,700 plus per year when you think about the costs of, of, of health uh, if you really don't get this engagement right and uh, positioned in the right way. And we saw that at Aon. We've seen that at Aon. And fundamentally for us, it was really about trying to create better alignment. It's exactly what Dean was describing. You know, at the end of the day, realize there's a cold hard reality across the U.S. The U.S. is overinsured. There's too much insurance being bought, and the U.S. is also underinvested. If you can actually help an employee in 16 minutes make a better decision for their family around, I'm healthy at this stage of my life, I should have a higher deductible and invest the difference, powerful. If you can help an employee decide, you know, I know I should have quit smoking a long time ago. But I didn't realize until I was actually in an ecosystem like, like the one that Dean created that if I do quit smoking, I can actually increase deductible, save on my, on my, on my health care cost, invest the difference, and over the course of my lifetime, maybe save another $100,000 to $200,000, which, by the way, is my own money. I actually may change my behavior now. So fundamentally, as we thought about it for Aon, much like Dean did, for us, it was a very logical ecosystem that's more powerful. Not easy to jump onto. But once you do, incredibly powerful in terms of what you see, and that's what we're seeing for our clients around the U.S. If you look at the healthcare, the absolute cost in a, in a, in a typical employer and the rate of increase, take the 2 to 3x that Greg described in terms of productivity and do the math on, put some of that back to the shareholders, take that and reinvest it. When I think about capital allocation 
and taking waste out of the system in the form of lost productivity because we don't because of the health uh, issues, redirecting that to growth ties to engagement, ties to financial results. So there is a, there is a reallocation of human capital into far more productive and far more um, exciting opportunities than wasting it in the healthcare system. So it's, this, isn't, this topic isn't limited to the, to the topic of health because what you do with that excess capability and capacity in redirect it can have, can have enormous, enormous implications in terms of growth opportunity. Uh, Dean, you, uh, you and uh, Sears as a company were um, early adopters, and uh, that's, who, that's a lot about uh, who you are as a leader. Um, but what, when you step back and you think, um, I'm a big company, I have lots of choices about where I spend my time on change and how I manage change, what, uh, talk a little bit about your decision to be an early adopter, what drove that decision, and, and how did that land with your associates? Um, your management team. Um, just talk a little bit about why you did it and what the what the change was to manage. So the uh, this was back in 2011. We were we were looking at the the looming ACA, and uh, and at that time, if you remember, there was so many things that were, was it going to happen? Was it not going to happen? So we began to look at our choices and go. What it was really the disruptor in terms of our decision making. Um, in the end, it wasn't the thing that drove the decision, but it certainly was the disruptor in making us think differently about healthcare. Um, and for years, we'd been making changes on the fringe. So we'd been changing plans, we'd been changing this. You know, every three years, we had the opportunity to change the carrier um, through the RFP. But we, we had, and we had done as, as much as we could. We had shifted as much as the cost to our associates as we could that are particularly, and still be competitive in the market. Our overall costs were below large employers and our aggregate costs were also below all retailers. So we had a very efficient um, healthcare cost system. So we couldn't take cost out, we couldn't shift the cost, and we couldn't do much on plan design. We tweaked at the edges as much. So when we looked at the opportunities, the exchange looked interesting to us. Um, obviously, we had a lot of decisions to take a look at. This was, uh, um, and being kind of uh, looking at this first, we need to lean in and see what the numbers look like. Um, when we, because it, it, it went against every paradigm that I'd ever known in HR, which is we're a big company, of course we're gonna be self-insured. Like that's, that's what you do, that's the right decision, you're gonna be self-insured. To go to a fully insured model and to talk to our CEO and chairman, Eddie Lampert, about going to that type of model and the board was gonna be a challenging conversation. So we put the numbers together and, uh, and did a basic estimate of what it was gonna be and it was in the um, tens of millions of dollars in savings to the company and still providing the same level of cost to our associates. So we could have tens of millions of dollars in increase by um, innovating on the edge or really leaning in on the exchange. Um, the biggest difference really is around this, the defined contribution piece. Because in the past, I spent a lot of time managing stop loss, are we gonna have a shot claim, what, and working with the accountants in terms of what are our costs this month, what can we, now I know in terms of a defined contribution, and I work, the accountants were really excited about it. Our CFO was actually reasonably excited because I know exactly what our healthcare is going to be at the end of the year as long as I know how many people are participating in the plan. It's a defined contribution. So the combination of defined contribution and then thinking about our associates um, who are used to, we're obviously going a lot, undergoing a lot of change and transformation and innovation in Sears Holdings. Um, we wanted to provide them more choice reasonable health care plan and the opportunity to save tens of millions of dollars in our plan for the company. And, uh, and then we crossed our fingers. We, um, would we, uh, but a year later, almost to the penny, we saved um, the tens of million dollars that we expected. There was no, and then since then we thought, okay, is there gonna be a big increase? And here's, here's the magic of what happened next. So in a regular RFP, I wouldn't have the opportunity to change costs for three more years because that's a big deal to go through the whole RFP process. But at Sears, we go through an RFP every year. So our associates go through this process. So the next year, if no one made a change, our costs would have increased 11.6%. If no one made any changes, no changes in plan level, no changes in carriers, because some carriers change their costs. What happened was, and Greg, to your point earlier, people thought, maybe I am overinsured. Maybe what is value for this particular carrier our cost went up 2.6%. The aggregate cost went up 2.6. Could have gone up 
if everyone made no change. And this, in year two, was still with only 52% of the people because we did a passive enrollment, so people could or do not. So 48% of the people just did nothing and uh, kind of let it roll over. So we still had that kind of financial impact with only 52% actually going in and making a decision. So anyhow, that is, uh, that's why we made the decision. And a year later, um, it proved in terms of savings and it continues as long as our associates continue to behave like consumers, and am I insuring myself right, am I making the right decision on carriers, we're still continuing, continuing to see the aggregate cost changes that we anticipated. So, Christy, if you think about what Dean just described, look, we're in the bastion of innovation right here. Right? This group of companies probably drives as much innovation in the global economy as any single group of companies anywhere in the world. Uh, when was the last time you heard about uh, substantial innovation in the ecosystem of buying health care for employees? The answer is it's been a long, long time. And Dean, I, thought, I, thought, I think I heard you, basically described Sears did well, employees did much better in terms of choice and options. Uh, and the carriers, by the way, continue to sign up because this isn't just about price, it's about value. Why, how could that happen? And that, that could happen because we created this ecosystem that created more alignment, more choice, more options that in fact has to be talked about every year. That little combination doesn't seem like a lot, but it actually changes behavior in employees, changes behaviors in carriers, and it changes behaviors in companies. And that really, I think, is what Dean's leadership, by the way, you, you have to have the leadership to pull it off at the company level, but with that leadership, that opportunity's there. In some respects, if you had that ability, this group had that ability to drive innovation in what you do, you take it off the charts. But in our little humble world, it's, it's a really powerful step that creates a set of behaviors which is fundamentally different. Great. We've been trying to make change for a long time and, and haven't been able to make big change. But one of the things that you need in, to, to innovate um, is a platform that enables um, innovation that's dynamic and a level of speed. A three-year RFP is not speed. If the only way for me to make change on our health care plan costs is to go out to RFP every three years. That is a snail's pace of change. At least now we're at every year. And so I'm literally, our associates are thinking about this every year. Am I, in, am I rightly insured? Is this the right plant carrier? What is the value that they're providing? Um, now change in innovation in the way they're thinking about healthcare happens at least annually, and I'm not the only one thinking about it. I have 98,000 people who are thinking about it in a very different way. You know, Dean, it's very interesting when you talk about um, the change on year two and the difference between 11% and 2%. Now, you might be thinking, that just means people bought down, right? They went with a higher deductible plan, they went with lower prices. Not so. If you look at the 650,000 people who have gone through two years of enrollment, about a th from, from year one, about a third move up in year two and about a third move down. So they are finding the right plan for them. They're making the trades. Year two, there's about a 10% shift. So they're narrowing and they're refining. So that netted out to the change that, uh, that Dean described. So Dean, when we talk about the, the leadership needed to, to really understand innovation, take advantage of it, lead through it, you know, anytime you're making a major market change, there's always inertia. There are early adopters like you, and there are iner there's inertia. So as you work with your peers across other large employers, uh, multiple industries, which I know that you do, how, how are you, th how, what are you hearing about inertia, um, adoption rates, how are, how are those leaders thinking about this trend and, and how they'll lead, lead, lead into it? Yeah, this is a, uh, I, I have a, a lot of conversations with my peers on this subject because I fundamentally believe that the more of us that are leveraging the exchange, the more we can get consumers to be, or our associates and employees to behave like consumers. But when I talk to my peers, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of control um, in terms of I get to pick the plan, I get to pick the plan design. There's an entire profession of benefits that does this for a living. This is a huge loss of controls and usually a lot of the decision makers are um, directors or VPs of benefits and uh, they're very reluctant. My, our head of benefits was a little reluctant in this because it's a major change and big loss of control. Um, so that's the first thing, being able to release this and let associates make the right decision. Moving from a very paternal in, um, decision making process, I know what's best for you, you can just, to actually moving the decision to the associates is a big change. The second thing is um, just this uh, busting the paradigm around fully insured, self-insured, like how can you do this? And I hear that, that's probably the first question I hear from my HR peers is like, you're, you're fully insured, how can that be? 
um, so how much more was this? Or then we get into the cost, and I go through the, our cost models. And uh, those are the two issues. I hear a lot, I, I just want to wait and see. And my question is like, what are you waiting for? What, what are you waiting to see? Like, uh, what, if you can see all decisions right now are in your, in your phone. You're making, making personal decisions about lots of things around, um, am I going to use a taxi or Uber? I mean, there's a lot of things that are being now that are very personal. Why isn't healthcare like that? Why is one person making the decision? And why can't we all enable people to make the right decisions for their own personal health care through this platform, which is now technology lets us do. It's change, right? There's, there's it's a huge change. change. It's fearful. Well, you know, obviously Aon has made a, a big bet in this area. We, uh, we view it as a, as a mission. Hopefully you can hear the, the passion and commitment in our, um, in our discussion here. But let me just ask Greg to go for a minute beyond exchanges. As we think about investments in other areas in, in health. When I think about this group and the impact you have on the, uh, the health care system, um, just some thought, Greg, in terms of beyond private health care exchanges, how are you thinking about health as a category for Aon? Well, fundamentally, as we think about it, this is, this is, the, this is our primary mission, one of our primary missions around the globe. Uh, and it really is, if we can humbly impact uh, the state of health in the U.S., the state of health in the world, uh, we've truly accomplished what Aon is about. You know, uh, you know, Basically, two billion part of 12 billion is uh, is really devoted fully to health from an Aon standpoint, um, and we really see it as as part of the mission. The thing that gives us greatest um, greatest satisfaction is seeing um, our partners work with their employees to change behavior to drive better outcomes. In some cases, it's via an exchange, fantastic. In other cases, it's around really understanding behavior that drives better outcomes and helping companies put those in place. But for us, Christy, it truly is. Uh, about driving better outcomes and we're convinced we're convinced that we absolutely have to evolve respectfully faster than our companies that we work with on this topic if we don't evolve faster than them innovate faster than them on this topic and bring new ideas to the table um, we can't succeed so that fundamentally that really is our mission that really is what what originated the original set of investments around exchanges one of which was the very substantial investment around fully insured multi-carrier uh, which we believe has very unique application in the market today with a range of others to, to really drive that mission and that outcome. We, uh, we have dedicated ourselves to getting off the dance floor, up on the balcony, and seeing the big picture and really optimizing the broad-based healthcare system because we believe it's the only way to achieve sustainable, sustainable change and, and impact. And like you, um, in terms of the outcomes you strive around medical devices, I don't think it's a big reach to connect consumerism and the topic of individual health care delivery and access to the consumer around devices and the providers who, who use those devices. This is an era of the individual, the consumer, and the choice they make. And uh, it is clear to me how the work that we're doing, and we've spent just a few minutes on today, connects directly with what you're doing in terms of driving a healthier population and a more effective healthcare system through your work. So um, we're going to be here for a few minutes uh, afterwards to address any, any questions that you might have. But um, truly appreciate um, your time today, uh, your leadership in the industry, and the opportunity to, um, to share some thoughts with you uh, the, this morning. Thank you very much.